paradoxically, why does quantum computation still rely on classical computation? A lot of people, when they've been talking about quantum computing or trying to preach about the potential benefits or widespread uses or use cases or applications of this technology and these types of algorithms, they've always drawn our attention to the fact that it could provide an exponential speed up over a classical algorithm. And I mean, that could hypothetically be true, or even in a more modest case, a quadratic speed up or some type of polynomial speed up to whatever the runtime is known for a classical algorithm. But the matter of the fact is that paradoxically, even though it might go against someone's intuition or someone's expectations, quantum algorithms still rely on classical computation. It's given by a fact that even if someone looks at, you know, the uh, recent conference present, well, not recent, but a while ago from the conference presentations that I gave for the American Physical Society in the April and March meetings, they really host a lot of great and really informative sessions for people who wanted to see about what's going on with quantum computing, as well as what are the differences between classical computation, as well as potentially several types of limitations or hindrances to making use of these algorithms. And for one, the way in which a quantum algorithm still ends up relying on classical computation in one way or another is, you know, through the cost function, because after all, when you're taking a bunch of results from a bunch of expectation values and adding them together to form some resultant superposition that you're using to optimize over when you're performing a variational quantum eigensolver or the generalization with the variational quantum algorithm that I've been discussing from different videos on my channel, you have to end up still making use of some fundamental operations from addition and multiplication when you're adding things together and trying to form a resultant superposition. Obviously, on top of that lowest hanging fruit of what is considered you know, classical computation that's still used in a quantum algorithm, you still have to make use of optimizers. And that's where a lot of, you know, open source optimizers that I looked at that I made use of came really handy and were really useful in the sense that when you perform this approximation of the cost function in which you're adding a bunch of expectation values together to form a resultant superposition, then you have to go back to the, to the classical computation, uh, to the classical means of computation with your optimizer because obviously there's not really necessarily um, <clears throat> any type of way to quantize or to make quantum an optimizer because ultimately an optimization is relating to single variable calculus and being able to find maxima and minima of different objective functions given several constraints. And basically what the optimizer does, like I use the infill optimizer a lot I use the open source NeverGrad optimizer from Facebook Research, which is really great. In the Facebook Research optimizer, it really was robust for a lot of types of ways for handling expectation values in trying to mitigate different types of numerical behaviors or instabilities that can show up from expectation values when you're trying to optimize a cost function. So, I mean, it just really goes to show that even though a lot of people are very much supportive and advocates for the fact that there's some ability of quantum computing to be able to, you know, uh, result in some exponential speed up in runtime. At the end of the day, for these, for many of these variational quantum eigensolvers and variational quantum algorithms to still be able to run and execute in polynomial or exponential speed up in runtime, there still has to be some reliance on the good old fashioned ways of um, classical computation.